Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back for another episode of The Keto Naturopath. Actually, I'm going to speak for just a little bit because I'm introducing an interview that I did today that I think needs a little elaboration up front. And that is that as much as we've talked about keto and the history and evolution of fasting and ketogenic diet and all the different aspects and so on, today I'm perhaps doing something even more important than that. And that is to explain about how a lot of the ketogenic products that have to do with oils, so it's MCT oil, it's uh, our product, C8 Keto MCT oil, may or may not be directly contributing to rainforest destruction. And so some of you have realized that ours is what they call an RSPO certified product. And it's a long process you have to go through. Most people have no idea what that stands for. It's Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil is what those, that acronym stands for. And it's a big, big deal. It's also a big, big and difficult process to get the logo and to be part of this movement of sustainable palm oil. So what I'm, I'm interviewing a, a man named Dan Stretchy, and he is the outreach person for entire North America for RSPO. And uh, he and I will have a a conversation that explains a lot of the objectives of RSPO, what they do, their difficulties in doing these things. And what I hope you will get out of this is that you will understand as a buyer, as a consumer, that yeah, you can vote with your dollars as they say. It's almost cliche to say that, but you can vote with your dollars to choose products that are RSPO or not RSPO. And so if you scan through all the other keto products that have to do with oil, you'll find none of them RSPO. And all of the C8 products, all the caprylic acid triglyceride products, except ours, is are non-certified. They'll say sustainably support sustainable harvesting. Well, where's the certification? Where's the verification of that? This is such an important issue with me and import and, and, and with us. And in part, yeah, it's um, what's the word? we're benefiting from this particular podcast by telling you RSPO. I, there's no other way for me to know, for me to be able to present this information apart from our product. So I don't, let's say you don't buy our product at all. I really do not care. I care that you understand what RSPO means and in its role, it's playing in the world globally right now in these next few years, in these last few years. It's a huge story. Anyway, so Dan and I will talk about this. It gets a little technical. I hope you follow. It has Absolutely nothing to do with the ketogenic diet or any aspect of the ketogenic diet other than when you buy such products, I hope you'll be thinking about, does this contribute to rainforest destruction, primarily in Southeast Asia, but any place in the world, as you'll learn about on the interview. Uh, And this is what I'm hoping to ignite, to give, to offer, to illuminate in you as a listening audience. There's a choice out there, and please care to understand that. Okay, on to the interview. Welcome everybody back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today we have a different interview, which I think actually in my view is probably the most important interview I've ever done. Um, And it's connected very peripherally to the issue of keto. So we're not going to be talking keto. We're going to be talking about how uh, one of the products that we are behind, C8 caprylic acid from derived from palm oil, and why we are RSPO and what that means. Most people have no idea of how important this particular aspect is of uh, palm oil and the uh, sustainably harvesting in RSPO. So today we have an interview with Dan Stretche, and uh, he is the North American outreach person. Thanks, Dan, for making some time. Uh, happy to be here, Carl. Thank you. So I thought we'd start off a little bit by just covering the the history of palm oil. You know, my background was I actually lived in Indonesia for uh, two to three years back in the late 70s up to 1980. And it was basically just a cooking oil then. And But since then, 
it's this huge industry that has taken off. Can you explain some of that and give a little context and we'll get into uh, your organization and a little bit later? Sure, sure. Um, you know, palm oil has been around for, for a very long time. It's actually um, the oil palm that is most common today is actually derived uh, was or started in, in Africa and was used as a cooking oil in Africa. And then through colonization and other aspects, it was taken and brought over to um, Asia. Um, really the modern palm oil industry, as I understand it, really got started in the turn of the century of the 19th century and then, uh, or uh, 20th century, and then really took off in the 70s. Uh, there was a lot of programs to create an agricultural uh, industry in, in some of the Southeast Asian countries, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia. If you fast forward to the modern um, uh, time period, the issue is that when, when they tried to develop these industries and, and really focused on it, it, it caused a lot of deforestation and other issues actually. But, but what it, it led to is the clearing of a lot of primary rainforest. And the reason that's, that's un, that was unfortunate and, and why it's such a problem is that the, the, that part of the rainforest region, that tropical rainforest region is, is sometimes called the lungs of the earth where you see a lot of production of rainwater, you see it's a huge carbon sink for those of us that are really concerned about climate change. Um, it, those forests are highly productive and eating and taking that uh, carbon out of the air. So we've really gone to a point where a, a tremendous amount of the forest in these countries was uh, taken down. Um, I don't know if uh, you'd like me to, but that really kind of led to the, to, I can get into the founding of our organization because that really kind of like leads right into it. Yeah, please Dan, go ahead. Sure. So even though this really was taking place for many years, it, it, it didn't really get the attention it needed until really into the late 90s. And by the late 90s and then the early 2000s, the, the momentum was there by many of the the really big actors in the industry to say okay we've got to do something different this is this is not sustainable and there at the same time there's starting to be market pressures where large companies large consumers of palm oil decided that they did not want to contribute to these issues these around deforestation and, and sometimes human rights so what happened in 2004 was the founding of the roundtable on sustainable palm oil or the rspo and this, what this led to is uh, initial group of companies, AAK, WWF, which is the World Wildlife Fund, Unilever, uh, MPLB, which is a Malaysian Palm Oil Association, um, and Migros, which is a retailer in Switzerland. They decided that they didn't want to contribute to this. Quickly, they realized if they're going to have impact, you have to scale it up. So what they did is they invited more and more companies to become a part of this roundtable. And in 2004, the roundtable was launched. Um, the first standard for the RSPO was then decided upon, voted upon by the membership, and in 2007 was released. Today, we, you know, going from those four members, we have almost 4,000 members. So probably by the end of the year, we'll have close to 4,000 members. Um, it's and I think that what that does is it just illustrates the, the interest on the topic from folks like yourself, Carl, who have a product, um, other large companies, small companies, medium-sized companies. They don't want to contribute to deforestation. They don't want to contribute to child labor, to, to human rights violations, to uh, workers uh, strife. What they want to do is they want to get a product that's highly functional, but they want to do it in the right way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. That's impressive, uh, both to see the change in the history. So when you're saying some of the, the big players initially got together, I mean, I, I love the aspect that you actually have a companies that have financial benefit, they have profits on the table, and they're saying we have to address this. That's uh, that. That's like the 
everybody's dream that the smart money does smart things with that kind of philanthropy. So what are, what are some of the, the obstacles you're doing right now? So right now you went from four to 4,000 members more or less by the end of this year. That's huge. And what, you know, the people I talk to are kind of uninformed of all this and they think it's kind of esoteric. So there's a lot of, they're not obviously big corporations, but what are some of the biggest obstacles you're working on now? What are the, if you can get them out of the way, one, two, three, four, what would they be? Yeah, I, you know, our stated mission as an organization is to make sustainable palm oil the norm. And we need to continue to grow the organization and to grow the uptake of um, sustainable palm oil. So number one challenge is getting people to use the material that's being produced. So if you're making a product, be it a healthcare product or a cleaning product or uh, a food type product, is to get people to reward the companies, both the grower on the ground and the manufacturer for utilizing the material. So we want people to buy the material and that's, that's uptake. Um, other challenges would be um, gaining consensus around the, the way to stop deforestation and human rights abuses in the industry. Um, that's, I think we're, we're uniquely positioned for that. Um, we are probably the, the number one convening organization when it comes to bringing the players um, to the table in the palm oil industry, but because we are a multi-stakeholder organization. And multi-stakeholder meaning that environmental and social NGOs can join our organization, banks and financial institutions, consumer goods manufacturers, retailers, growers and refiners, really everyone has the ability to sit at the table and to join our organization. And that that's extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. um, other challenges remain in, in terms of um, the implementation of the standard, getting more people to certify the growing regions and um, to, uh, to implement the, what we call our principles and criteria. I guess the a fourth re, uh, challenge or opportunity would be continuing to expand the organization in globally in terms of the consuming markets. So maybe this relates to the first point, but we really got to get movement in China and India. So they're the two largest destinations by tonnage for for palm oil. And without their markets starting to um, have uptake on certified sustainable palm oil, um, including Indonesia, which is a large consumer, you, you really aren't going to transform the market. You know, what we don't want to do is we don't want to just become a standard that only makes palm oil safe, if you will, for Europeans and Americans. That's not <laughs> what I want to see. I want to see everyone across the globe, in Latin America, in Asia, Europe, Africa, um, all utilizing sustainable palm oil and, and have the ability to, to make a purchase and vote with their wallet to, to reward those producers. That's a big goal. Uh, and I, that's very impressive. That it sort of speaks to two questions. One is, uh, you know, why, what is the form and what is the primary use for palm oil in those particular two countries? And the second question would be, uh, clearly all this uh, depends on education. I mean, that's the point of this podcast right now for, for the local people that know me and the product is like, and, and that's a big step. So how do, how do you go about that education for those particular countries? And I guess there's a third question. How is it that North America and Europe are different than those two in your words? You know, why is it uh, Europe and, uh, and the United States, whatever, North America are aware slash or are more concerned or more involved and though those others aren't? So what's your take there? Well, I, I think, I, let me start with the third question first, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, the, the European market, if you look at the founding, two of the very largest members were European that founded the organization. So there was a lot of building awareness of the issue in Europe really was the primary move. It's, it remains the largest market for our SPOMA material. Um, so 
uh, it was natural that the Europeans would be the first movers. I think the, the, what you're seeing is you're seeing rapid growth in the U.S. market now in terms of uh, companies implementing their sourcing policies. A lot of that has to do with the Consumer Goods Forum and the New York Declaration on Forests, which is a UN um, agreement uh, that was signed on the, the sidelines of the, I think, the 2014 or 2015 UN Climate Summit. And, you know, you, you're seeing them move very quickly. We are seeing movement in China and in um, some, some positive momentum in uh, other consuming nations like Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia. Um, India remains tough. You know, palm oil can go in anything from your foodstuffs to like cookies and rolls to uh, used for frying and cooking oil, but it can also go into cosmetics. It can also go into cleaning. There's an, a whole oleochemical industry that is focused on palm oil and the use of it. So, you know, palm oil though, is also kind of sometimes a hidden ingredient, if you will. <laughs> it's not going to be the first listed ingredient for, mo for the majority of the products it's used in. For the majority of the products, it's kind of the sixth, tenth, twelfth ingredient, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not always right in front of the consumer, um, be it in a, in a developing market or a developed market. So a lot of times people aren't aware that they're using it. You know, when you tell people that they probably brush their teeth with palm oil, uh, there, that there was palm oil in their toothpaste, most people are shocked to learn that. Yep. Uh, so from my perspective, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to educate consumers, but I think that we also have to educate the companies and we have to educate, we have to continue to educate manufacturers that they need to ask for sustainable palm oil, that it's not just, uh, they, they can't wait for the consumer to make the request. The, the consumer, you know, they have a lot to think about. Uh, you know, I, as, a, as a, a parent here uh, based in New York, you know, you, you're, you're rushing between work and family obligations. If you're at the store, a lot of people aren't picking up the, the packaging and looking at it. So I think it's it's really on the companies right now mm -hmm. to make that transition to sustainable palm oil. And you know, for example, for you, you've you're you're doing that. You you've made the specific choice to join the RSPO to to utilize certified sustainable material. I forget what um, supply chain you're using, but to implement a sourcing policy mm -hmm. right. and with urgency. That was one of the first things that you did when you were working on it. And right. that's what I like to see in this market. I want to see people use the opportunity to implement their sourcing policies before the consumer asks for it. Yeah, that's a big deal. Let me interject uh, a couple things. But the, the process is it's pretty straightforward, but it's not without its delays and expenses. And I, I, I think that's how it should be. So, um, for people listening, in case people are going, so I, there I, I, I want to absolutely choose sustainable palm oil. And if you're a manufacturer or retailer, you're saying, what does it entail? Well, I guess I call myself a manufacturer since we're, we have we go to a supplier and go to a bottler and we produce a product. And so we have to first be a member. That's a cost. And RSPO asks for a plan. You know, it wasn't like check, uh, take our money and then give us a little check saying, what is your plans? What is your, and I, I was really impressed with that. You actually have to renew this plan each year and obviously pay a membership each year. Then after that, you have to find a source of the oil or whatever it is that you're after now as a manufacturer that is, you know, RSPO certified. So that's that. But then the next step is wherever your bottler or your manufacturer is, you have to uh, fly in a team, in essence, if you're usually two to three people that will examine how you're using this oil to make sure that it's not uh, contaminated or adultified in any way or changed, given what you're, you, what the thing is that you're making. And so that's an added cost. And it's like, so for people choosing this path, it's a conscious path. It's not an easy sort of like, I decided to go green as opposed to be destroy the world. It's like, yeah, you decided to go green and that's a good thing. Now you're, and I, I'm 
100% with RSPO saying, now you're going to have to sort of like back it up. We want people who are actually acting on this, not just, you know, smiling at us through the window kind of thing. And I'm, I'm very impressed. It's, but it's an expense right up there. So all these companies, I'm sure they have a scaled cost, but it's interesting. It's that. And, um, you know, now that I'm into the process, I'm all about it. But initially, I'm going, wow, it's getting deeper and deeper. It's not just, you know, check and, uh, and you have to deal with Malaysia, which is more or less with the uh, Carolyn Yao, if she's the secretary. But anyway, so all these people are all re- really interesting. And so there's that. The other, I wanted to go backtrack just a little bit. And because you implied it, is like there are so many different applications for palm oil. And in my learning curve, I, I learned a lot was even industrial, industrial in the sense for like aircraft. And I think, really? And I, you, you catch these flashes in the news. I think it was uh, Braniff Airlines or something decided they're not going to use palm oil. You know, first you go, what would an uh, airline industry uh, need with palm oil? Well, that's, that's it. It's a derivative. I guess that would be the oleo uh, derivative of palm oil that they use for whatever product they use. It's like, and it, and it brings the question of, as we get very concerned, I'm sure a lot of people are really concerned about the deforestation, or they should be, and certainly the lungs of the earth, just like with the Amazon. But the knee-jerk response is, all right, well, I, I, we won't use, I'll identify what's, you know, what products have palm oil, and I'll decide not to use it. That's not necessarily an answer. You know, I, that's, that's short-sighted, and it may be more destructive. Uh, do you agree, and could you elaborate? Because I think that's a big point. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, palm oil is in a lot of things, and they, they actually do use it as a biofuel, both for, for cars and for, for Jet A, which is flies for airplanes and or powers airplanes. And so it, it is a very versatile material. And, you know, when, air, when someone like an airline or someone says that we're not going to use it, um, particularly let's say for their the food that is in their um, products that they serve on on board you know we wouldn't prefer what they would do is support the growers that have implemented the RSPO system and reward them for taking it and and making it more sustainable because we know and and even some of our, the harshest critics of the RSPO will agree that if you remove palm oil from a product you need to use another oil so it's not that you're you know it's it's good intentions unintended consequences where Mm -hmm. you could be causing more deforestation by switching away from palm oil and you know recently the the international union of uh conservation naturalists came out with a report that basically stated that you know there are huge issues around the palm oil industry but switching to a different oil and 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 doing a mass buy, boycott of palm oil would actually lead to more deforestation. So we we know that what we have to do is we have to focus on um, doing it the right way. That just just turning away and running away from a problem is not going to fix anything. I mean, if your house was on fire, you know, obviously you want to get out of it, but you hopefully are going to also call 911 and get the fire department to come and try to put out the fire. Right. You know, we, we know also that, you know, the oil palm is a plant. And the real issue with the oil palm and the production of palm oil has been where and how it's been grown. You have to grow it within 10 to 20 degrees of the equator. That happens to be where the highest amount of biodiversity is. That's where all of that really important tropical rainforest is, but it's also where some of the fastest developing countries are located and some of the poorest populations on earth. So where and how it's grown is a huge issue, but we also know that if it, if it's for it, that it's four to 10 times, uh, has four to 10 times the yields of other oil seeds. So the, the plant itself can actually be quite sustainable, but where and how it's been grown has been unsustainable and that's what we're trying to fix what we're trying to do is to to not just pull a few actors in the industry we're trying to pull the full industry and get the get sustainable palm oil to be the norm and we're and we're doing that not by just punishing people what we want to do is get people to get rewarded for doing the right thing because we know that 
you know, not to use the word sustainable again, but if you're going to make a sustainable industry that isn't doing harm to biodiversity and to, to workers and to humans and communities, you need to make it also, also profitable and they have to be rewarded in a market-based system. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a couple of points that I want to dig up and when go back to the agricultural aspect. In my view, and please correct me if I'm and I'm wrong. One of the great things about palm oil, I mean, how it's formed, it's a, it's not an annual plant. So it's not like corn. It's not like a lot of other plants that each year the ground needs to be tilled up again. And uh, with all that, you get erosion. And we know that in the United States, it's one of the big uh, criticisms of a lot of the crops that we use, quote unquote, for food or feed for, for animals is that you have this continual digging up of the soil. I mean, it goes back to the Dust Bowl. It's still the same thing, but with slight modification. And if you had a plant for whatever reason, now I'm being very general, that you didn't have to do that with, that you basically, you know, it was already there, that you didn't have to dig up the soil again and again. That's a remarkable difference. So to go from an annual to a, a perennial plant it is a big difference. And so in that sense, that's what you mean when you say the plant itself is sustainable. However, uh, how it's being the idea that it's d causing so much de deforestation, that's the non-sustainable part. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the, the oil palm is, again, it has sustainable attributes to it. The, for example, as you mentioned, you don't need to cut it down yearly. It, it, it actually, it's, it's a perennial. So it's, the crop is, is typically lasts about 23, 25 years before you actually cut it down. The only reason you're usually cutting it down is because it's getting too tall to harvest. That, that leads to a very good attribute for smallholder farmers. So as opposed to having annual crop rotations or, or annual crops that don't produce income yearly, the oil palm in, these, in, in, the, in this equatorial region is producing income year round. And that, that's really important when you're a farmer that's not making a tremendous amount of money. I mean, farmers are challenged for profit all over the world. Um, when you're a small hold farmer, and, and in our standard, that's like less than 50 hectares or roughly 112 uh, acres, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's important. So yeah, I, I don't disagree with it. I think it's, it's important to look at the positive attribute, attributes of the crop, um, recognizing that we need, there's a lot of work to be done to make it sustainable about where and how it's grown. So you pretty much have to work at both ends as an organization. As you say, you want to uh, offer the carrot, you want to offer the reward on, on any size farm, smallholder or not. And that has to do with, the benefit there has to do with sustaining a culture, the people's culture. At the same time, we're on the other end, the retail end saying, you know, please get involved because you know, you're part of the whole thing. And so that's quite a, that's quite a, a objective. I mean, you're into people's homes in essence, um, you could be, or, and, and, or communities. And that speaks to different countries. That speaks to different political situations. That speaks to a lot of variations on a theme uh, that you have to be sensitive to. And I would guess one of the benefits of you getting involved in that community, that home, that country is that you have uh, implied a international voice that does relate to uh, human rights. You know, you get to see how said farm is being taken care of and you're saying, you know, uh, if you're RSPO, these are some of the criteria we have and will incentivize you to be, become part of that. It's, is that true? And would you elaborate on that as well? I mean, you have a clearly a global perspective yeah, we, we have members in, I think, something like almost 90 countries around the globe. And um, we definitely have a, a global perspective. And, you know, I, I think if you look at a lot of times the solutions that are put forward to fix, quote unquote, fix the palm oil industry, uh, a lot of them are black and white. If you do this, you, everything will be sustainable and it'll be better or it'll be black and white. Just don't use it. And then, you know, a lot of times that comes from the consuming uh, areas of the, of the globe yep. and then growing areas, the production 
zones, if you will, they have very black and white solutions, like just leave us alone and let us develop our agricultural situation, uh, yeah. uh, industry. We're, we really fall into the gray space, and we think that's actually a good space to play because what we want to do is bring everyone together, and we're consensus-driven, and everyone should be a little bit unhappy with the result, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. It's like good legislation that we, we used to pass in this country where both sides would be a little bit unhappy, but both – both sides actually got a lot about what they were asking for or asking for. And um, we want to be in that gray space where everyone's a little unhappy, but we moved the industry in the right direction overall. And we did it by bringing everyone along, not just the, the, the best player in the industry, but the, the worst player. We want to move them as well. Um, our CEO, uh, Daryl Weber, has an analogy where, you know, a lot of people come to our organization and they say, you know, essentially they want us to have the Ferrari of the standard and Ferraris are fantastic. I mean, I would love to have one, you know, you, but the problem with a Ferrari is, or the, the benefit of the Ferrari is you go very fast. It's flashy. It looks great. It's top performing, but you can only bring one person with you. You can only fit one person in the Ferrari with you. Right. We are more of the bus. We are a very loud bus where anyone can get on to the bus. It's a noisy bus. There's lots of opinions on the bus. And the bus moves a little bit slower. But we want to be the bus because we want everyone to have access to trying to do the right thing. And we want to pull people in direction. Now, I'm sure we'd all like the bus to be a very fast bus. But, you know, we have to work within the 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 context of the industry but we don't want to leave people behind we want to bring the 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 the, the actor that's not well respected and the well respected and you know if if the really good actor wants to go beyond our standard great you know use us as a tool to build capacity and then exceed our standard we're, we're good with that but let's also bring that person that's considered the laggard Let's get them on. Let's move them. Let's improve them because I think that actually might have um, just as big of an impact, if not more. Absolutely, absolutely. So you you guys just had one of your global meetings in Paris, the RSPO Paris, and I think it's annual meeting. And so I assume if too many people clap at the end of the said conference, you guys are unhappy. I mean, you're unhappy if they're happy. Is that it? So much. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we just want to ensure that, you know, that we're discussing challenges yeah. in a realistic context so that we don't give the impression that everything's perfect because it's not. No, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Uh, your task has to do with different education levels, different cultural orientations, uh, different financial, I'll say aptitudes. You know, you, you're talking to the CEO of, well, it was Nestle's is one of the names in the headlines of late, you know, is a whole different thing than talking to uh, small farmers in uh, either Africa or Indonesia or, or Central America. How amazing that is and the, the talents it takes and the organization size it takes to bring in these different uh, people to do this. Speaking of which, can you just cover, because I, I think the sense of how truly global, everybody uses the word global, and uh, it, it, it's true with you all. And so that you have, was it three global meetings? You have Paris and um, uh, a meeting in, uh, I don't know if it's Mexico, but Central America, maybe it's Venezuela or something, and then also in Asia. And these are kind of the hubs for your annual meetings or... Your yeah, we, I mean, we, we do, uh, we have a European round table and then we have a, a major global round table that takes place in Southeast Asia each year. And that's really because of the focus of the industry, the majority of the production is there. We have the European um, round table because that, that, that focuses a lot on a, a very large consuming market uh, so that you get a lot of good, uh, input from the consumers and when i say consumer i mean like the refiners the consumer goods manufacturers we also have uh, a latin american conference that we do every two years and that's because latin america is one of the fastest growing regions by grower membership and certified hectares so we we want that uh, we we call that a new frontier for oil palm production or palm oil production. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we're we're giving the attention to that market 
that's due so that people that, so that we're engaging with the, the, the proper stakeholders. Um, and that, that conference took place in, in Cali, uh, Colombia this year, this June. Um, so uh, right now we've, we've got those out of the way, those two conferences. Now we're looking forward to our, our global RT or roundtable, which will be in November of this year. And it's really, you know, really important to note that this is also when our members are able to vote on new initiatives of the RSPO. So after the RT, we have our general assembly and ordinary members of our organization are able to, to vote at this. And this is a really important time for the RSPO because we're at uh, our standard as part of the ICL Association of um, Certification Standards is up every five years. So best practices tell us that every five years, you, at least, you should give your membership an opportunity to revise your standard if they'd like. So we're in the, actually in the process of doing that right now. And um, we, what we're going to call the Principles and Criteria 2018 is out for public consultation. The public consultation on the standard ends on August 2nd. Yeah, the last round of public consultation, we got something like 10,000 comments. I think we'll, we'll probably get just as many, if not more, this, this round. And what it will do is inform a standard that will then be voted on by our members at this global conference, this General Assembly, in uh, the Borneo region of Malaysia, in, in Sabah, in uh, Kota Kimbali. Wow. And th that's, it's, you know, we're, again, we're a consensus-driven organization. This standard is being designed by our membership. Uh, we have a, a task force that's driving it, and it's taking in feedback, obviously, from the membership. They they have the most ability to influence the standard, but we're also opening it up to the public. Um, and when I say public, I really mean people that are working on the issue of palm oil, um, you know, NGOs, government agencies, and countries that uh, have interest in uh, growing a, an oil palm industry. Um you know, we really want that feedback because what we want is to design a standard that has the ability to to work uh, globally, um, but also helps us achieve the mission of making sustainable palm oil in North. Absolutely. Um, I have two questions, one partially selfless, selfish and uh, they're just more informative. Going back to agriculture and we said, you know, how it, this is really the most efficient plant for uh various oils of palm oil and and people would then say well why don't we plant something else we sort of said well it's it's inefficient the two names that come up are usually coconut and then soy or soy then coconut like well let's do this you know brazil's doing soy and i just wanted to hit that nail on the head perhaps a second time by saying that's inefficient and they have their own issues can you elaborate a little bit on that without feeling you're denigrating another industry but to, to because people do ask that. That's a an informed customer would ask, you know, why do I do well, this? Go ahead. I mean, th there's specific attributes to palm oil that are um, beneficial that can't be replicated by other oils without the production of certain things that are some health uh, organizations deem as um, uh, unhealthy, such as the trans fat issue. But we don't really get into that as a standard. We're not... A health standard we're a sustainability standard right um but there is obviously the yield the yield is is an issue it, when you when you have four to ten times the yield of other oil seeds and that includes the ones you mentioned that that's that's a really positive attribute and if you can grow the material correctly you actually produce a more sustainable product so from from our perspective what we don't want to see is other oil seeds replace the oil palm and you know we're a single commodity standard. We don't govern all oil seeds. We or oil vegetable oils. We work on palm oil. So immediately, if someone goes to a different oil that may be causing other issues, we have no ability to to impact and and to to make that system better. Hmm. You know there are other organizations. Uh, you know notably the the roundtable on sustainable soy comes to mind. Um, so there are soy producers doing it well. But the fact is that oil palm, where it's grown today, can be sustainable. And, you know, just moving to another oil seed does not fix the problem. In fact, it may cause other issues. So 
it's better to do look at what performs best in your product and source it sustainably. Right. Yeah, no, that's the bottom line. Absolutely. So um, the selfish question, how would one, you know, uh, here we are, or I'll represent retailers. They love the idea of conservation that was probably in them from the beginning. And this is why they've chosen RSPO oil. How would they get more involved? I mean, they can go to some of these meetings that you stated, part of me says, I would love to go back to Indonesia or Malaysia and some of these places here to really bring that story forward on a per product basis. So people see that, you know, whether it's a video with the product or something. So they, you know, in addition to the RSPO, it's the RSPO and then in that sort of video and saying, it's, it's a, this is a real world. They've reached across the ocean ocean by, by getting more involved. What would you say to that? Or saying, well, it's not necessary. We're doing it all or yeah, get involved. Yeah, I, I think people should get involved. I think companies and manufacturers, retailers should get involved. Yeah, I, I think, again, they, they have an opportunity to do it before their consumer is fully engaged. I think we do have some great resources on our website, some videos, yep. um, videos with smallholders, smallholders talking about why they want to be part of the 139,000 smallholders that are in our standard. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, there's a lot of reasons to get involved. I think most people want to make sure that other people can have what they have. You know, I think most of us would look at countries that are developing and say, I would like them to have a middle class. I would like their kids to have access to education, to have access to a better life. You do that by rewarding people that are doing it the right way. And you know, focusing on the sustainability of how you make a product. If you're a retailer, you know, if you have your private label brands, those should be, you should be looking at to see how they're produced, you know, what the oil is going into it and have a, a sustainable sourcing policy. There's some notable retailers in the U.S. that are not members of the RSPO. Consumers can ask those retailers to join the organization to make their products better. If they see uh, products that use palm oil that are, they're not members, they're not what we call supply chain certified. They should ask, why not? Why aren't you? They should. So there's action that consumers can take and your listeners can take every day. And there's apps out there. There's, you know, we have an app that's growing in capabilities and um, there's, there's a Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has an app that helps consumers make choices. So I think there are ways for consumers to have an impact. And, uh, you know, I think you, the companies want to do the right thing. I mean, most companies, if you work for a corporation, you really, you really do want to do the right thing. Sometimes you're just not aware that you need to do. Two questions I want to have, because I know I'm keeping my eye on the, uh, on the clock here, is that you've had such amazing growth from basically 2004 to the principles 2007, four, four members to basically 4,000 now. What are your goals in the future in terms of, let's say, 2020? And just before that, if you could sort of say, since we're speaking in North America now, what has been the growth in North America of companies or uh, to come on and get involved in RSPO? You know, where uh, of those who are using our uh, using palm oil, how many? If there's that's even a figure that you can come up with, are part of RSPO? And then what do you foresee in the future? Let's say by 2020. Sure. I mean, in, in North America, and I'm going to speak specifically to the U.S. and Canada, in, in 2016, we had 33 members in Canada, and in the U.S., we had something like 239. Today, we have 60 members in Canada and 445, I think, in the United States. So we've pretty much doubled the membership in both countries in, in, the, in two years. So, you know, we we really think that, you know, the U.S. specifically, or I think that the U.S. specifically should be the largest country by membership. We need to continue to grow it. Um, you know, we're a huge country. We're not a huge user of palm oil, but there's a lot of decisions made here that impact other countries. So the, the, I think the impact of the country is a little bit bigger than its, its annual imports of palm oil. So... But we also think it's realistic just for what's being used in the U.S. by the end of 2020 to get to 100% certified sustainable palm oil in the United States through the four RSPO supply chains. So what we would love to see in this market is 
that every ounce of palm oil that's coming in is either covered as a physical, physically sourced palm oil or by our credit system, our book and claim uh, credit system called RSPO credit mm -hmm. with a focus on individual um, or independent smallholder credits, which is a really great way to support the smallholders, which are so vital to the palm oil industry and the sustainable palm oil industry. And, you know, we, we see really fast growing rates of supply chain certified facilities in the United States where consumer manufacturers have, or consumer good manufacturers have asked their manufacturers to, or have gone and gotten certified. And yep. that's important because then we know they're using physical material. So these are all things that we watch and, you know, we're bullish on, on the market. We think that the market has room to grow and we have, think it has room to, to be one of the leaders worldwide. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That little point that you mentioned about manufacturers getting certified, I'll say slash audited, that's what we did for our manufacturer. We're now going on to another manufacturer. We'll have to do the same for them as well. But that's no small thing. So do you sort of learn what's necessary to do? You know, as you're on the track, you find this, you find the material that you're after that's uh, RSPO, but now you have to go to a manufacturer, talk to them about the situation, <laughs> and tell them why yeah. it's in their best interest. And, you know, they're opening themselves up to a, a market that they heretofore didn't even know about. That's how I presented it anyway. We, we paid for them to do that, but it took time for them to go through. No, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, I think if they also take a look at who our membership is in the United States, then they can see the business opportunity. And that, yeah. I think that's why we we'll want to continue to grow the organization in the U.S. and Canada to get the business case for these small and medium actors in the in the supply chain because it, it, this sh we shouldn't be a standard that's just for the biggest players I, again the goal is to get to 100% in the market and we don't do that by just by ignoring any subset of the manufacturers that we have to have everyone come along and uh, and try to get them involved and that's how you make it the norm yep no, absolutely um, i wanted to pivot a little bit because you told me um, how RSPO is uh, connected with Ulia. And could you explain what Ulia is, why you got connected with them? And uh, I just think it's, uh, it's it sends a, a chill down my spine in a good way. That, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the, the bigger growing areas of concern for the palm oil industry is human rights and worker rights, community rights. Um, so how are, how is the development of palm oil or in the past, how has the development of palm oil plantations or production impacted communities, workers, and, and other humans in the, uh, in the industry or around the industry? And, you know, we're, we're not a perfect standard. We know that we have issues that we have to grow and evolve. Um, one of the areas that we, we continue to grow and evolve is, is really beefing up and strengthening um, guidelines around labor, workers, and community. And, um, you know, when we have an issue, it's been more difficult than deforestation is obvious, right? You, you yep. see the trees there and then they're not there. And we have a tool online called GORSBO, which you can use to, to see uh, where our, the concessions of our, our members are, things like that. But seeing human rights through an audit or through uh, satellite technology is, is not easy. Um, you don't see it. Um, audits help provide the structure that allow us to discover it though. So when we do discover it or we get a complaint, what we've found is we still need a better way to talk to the workers. So the Ulia platform allows us to get what we call worker voice. So what we're trying to do is to get, have communication um, through surveys, through simple devices like a very simple cell phone uh, or a link that's sent out to uh, to workers where they can then report back on the policies of their company. Because what we want to do is we want to get kind of that unannounced audit, if you will. And right. for human, when, you, when you're dealing with human rights issues, that's extremely important. This technology, we've field tested it. We're just getting back the results for it now. We think this is going to be a, a really exciting platform for us to scale up and to use one, either we have a complaint where people have um, 
let us know that they, they see an issue, or if we feel there's an issue, if we see articles or the secretariat gets, uh, uh, let's say, a whistleblower to call, we can use this technology now to more quickly remediate these types of issues and, and if needed, take action against the member. So to see, so I'm, I'm picturing to see this uh, implemented, uh, there's a farm someplace, and I'll say Indonesia, and so there's workers there. Do, do each one sort of get a cell phone? Is it an app? We're assuming they have a cell phone, they put an app on it, or is there one member in a group of workers that will have this kind of uh, technology, whether it's the app or the phone? And then the other thing is like, wow, that's a lot of power for workers. You know, I mean, that's, that's, um, wish we had that in the United States in some ways, <laughs> you know, but... But yeah, I, yeah. I mean, they can they can either be handed or given um, a cell phone, uh, like a, a very basic type of communication device, or they can use their existing technology. I think what you find when you travel, you know, most people have smartphones or cell phones yeah. these days, and um, it's it's a very good way of of getting to it. And what you try to do is you try to get a very healthy statistically relevant sample size of the workforce and you try to communicate with them and you know that there's going to be you know outliers on both that overly support the company and or and overly support the worker rights it's like but you can filter out that noise um, utilizing this this organization Ulia and they they can filter out that type of um, noise and they can start to get a real good impression about what's taking place and what thing. And then we can use that data at the secretariat level um, to then either prescribe the remediation and what needs to take place or what are the next steps and how we, we do we suspend the member? Do we, you know, what do we do? Um, so it's, it's exciting for us. It's, it's extremely new. I mean, we literally just launched this in June on June twelfth, um, so we're 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 trialing it, but the goal is to scale it up and use it um, across the 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 RSPO membership. Wow, um, I'm going to introduce that. So Ulia has its own website, so it's uh, ulia.com, U L U L A dot com. They have a blog, and they don't shy away from from. St- Startling issues. I'm just going to say how responsible uh, responsible supply tech is helping tackle modern slavery and human trafficking. That's wow. That's I mean that's a big deal. I know we haven't said that in this conversation, but we know that that's happening. And the other one is human trafficking and global supply chains. And they give an example, and uh, that was quite a story. And so it's dealing with hard issues. It's uh, in one way it sounds like i'm paraphrasing sort of unionizing workers rights which is a good thing you know we we still struggle with in this country but another way it goes right to some of the issues that really need to be tackled that are are just tear jerking issues that uh, i'm so impressed I, you know and it makes perfect sense that you guys would hook up because you have your presence globally and getting into these areas or on the equator yeah no we're we're really excited about that opportunity to partner with them on this this program this uh this platform uh, and yeah, modern slavery; those are huge issues. Human trafficking, modern slavery, and and no industry is in the U.S. For some reason, Dan, I just lost you. Oh, sorry. Okay, you're back. Okay, I want to make sure you stay on track. It's 10:55 per my watch, and um, I so appreciate your time. And uh, I'm going to let you go. And uh, with always a caveat in the future, we can talk more. I thank, thank you for your time and your <laughs> time of doing this twice for, with me. And uh, this is getting the word out. I'm all behind it and uh, more to come. Thanks, Dan. Well, thanks. Thank you, Carl. And, and thank you for becoming a member. And thank you for taking a step to get uh, supply chain certified for your product. Uh, your consumers are doing the right thing and voting with their wallet when they purchase your product. And uh, hopefully we'll see more and more organizations take those steps. I hope so. And it's more inevitable as you would say. All right. Take care. Get going. Bye bye. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult, and the easy week after week.